With that said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Dave Bevan. He's the education lead of modeling immunity to empiric pathogens, and he's also a professor of biochemistry at uh, Virginia Tech. He will provide the initial introduction on uh, computational and mathematical model. So, what I want to do next then is give an introduction to computational model. And we have objectives that you may have seen on the website. This is a shortened version of all of those, but I do want to review these. This is what we want to accomplish in the Sunday School. And so you're going to be learning more about NIP, and, and Joseph gave you a bit of an introduction, but you're going to be hearing some research talks in which we go into much more depth about what's going on here uh, at the center. Uh, you'll also be developing some computational models during some of the hands-on exercises. Uh, learning how to do some of these kinds of things so that hopefully you'll be able to apply it in your own research. Uh, there are different modeling methods that can be used. You'll at least learn a little bit about these and how one might distinguish among them. Uh, one of the things we'll emphasize is the connection between experiment and modeling and the iterative process that's part of that. And the other thing we hope to do is create an environment to foster collaboration. Uh, there may be, and I've already seen some of this starting, but opportunities for discussion so you can really learn about what other people are doing uh, and perhaps there'll be things that can grow out of this, either collaborating with people here at Virginia Tech or uh, between people at other institutions. Uh, so we do have things built into the schedule, uh, the coffee breaks, the lunch breaks, there's a reception tonight, there's another reception on Thursday evening, the one on Thursday evening will have a poster session, uh, so that's another opportunity then to just find out a little bit more about what various people are doing. Uh, so do take advantage of that. But I do apologize in advance if you're in the middle of some nice discussion and we have to interrupt to get you back up in this room or one of the other rooms to keep things on schedule. We may do that from time to time. Okay, so I want to go briefly through the math as, as part of all of this. I've had calls or emails from a number of people wondering, well, is, is this summer school going to be right for me. I'm an experimental immunologist. I really don't do any modeling. That's the target audience, in fact, for this particular summer school of the experimental immunologist who may not have a lot of background. And so here, if you think about what integrated systems biology might be, and clearly they're applying integration in biology, but that perhaps might not have been what that particular participant was hoping for. Uh, in this particular case, there's certainly math going on as part of these models, but a lot of that is going to be behind the scenes if you want to look at it that way. One of the goals of MIF and, and uh, some of the other programs is to really develop software tools that can be used by non-mathematicians, non-computer scientists, practicing immunologists, experimental immunologists, who want to apply these as tools but don't want to delve into the details. So you will be introduced some of those tools over the course of the week. I've got some definitions here. Uh, these are actually come from a National Academy study that was done. And I make the distinction because the terms will come up from time to time. And in fact, much of what I do during this uh, time I'm going to be talking this morning is talking about different terms, making distinctions, so hopefully it will make more sense to you. But the distinction between bioinformatics and computational biology. And it was not only because the National Academy group came up with these definitions, but also I agree with them, and so that's why I'm showing them. But basically, if you talk about bioinformatics, we're often talking about the collection of data, the storage of data, the mining of these large data sets. Whereas computational biology, which is more in tune with what we're covering here in this particular summer school, we're applying mathematical methods, computational methods, uh, in building various kinds of systems, if you will. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about systems biology uh, as we go through this lecture. Now, this slide, and I realize you won't be able to see all the text. I've got references here for some of these things. But this basically shows how a lot of this fits together. And I've picked these references, in many cases, for a particular reason. Uh, so this is out of Jermaine's lab at NIH, and one of the authors of this particular review it was an annual review that's came to immunology a couple years ago. One of the co-authors is Mark, Martin Meyer Schellershine. He'll be here later in the week. He'll be part of the summer school and the symposium on Friday. So we have the opportunity to meet him uh, as well, particularly as it pertains to multi-scale modeling. But what we have here are a number of different components. We've got immunology, bioinformatics, 
uh, and so on, ultimately enabling us to develop, to develop predictive models. Prediction is one of the things that we want to be able to do with these models if they're really good. And so we have various kinds of data that can be brought into this. And each of you may have different kinds of data that are important to you, and those are the ones you model. And so I suspect they fall somewhere within this relatively broad range of the, the, the focus. Okay, so with systems biology, uh, what we're really talking about, and we've got a couple definitions up here, quantitative methods of mathematical analysis and modeling, comprehensive analysis of interactions, and then I've got a graph here that shows really the iterative process, and I put immunology in there within the biological applications, I added it onto this image. Now, if you were to just Google systems biology images, you're going to get a lot, so you might wonder why I picked this one. Uh, the reason I picked it is if you look at the URL, it's itcast.bt.edu. And you may recognize it. We're in Kelly Hall, which is the home of ITCAST here at Virginia Tech, the Institute for Critical Technology and Applied Sciences. We get a lot of acronyms over the course of the week as well. Uh, but in any case, there are people here doing systems biology as well, bioengineered livers, for example, um, and other kinds of things. So a lot of collaboration going on within the building and also around campus with people um, with interest in systems biology. Uh, and then in this particular quote, I thought was particularly uh, pertinent here uh, because really what we're trying to do is understand how function arises, but really it's also in dynamic interactions. It's not necessarily the static ones. And we'll talk a bit about the distinctions there and the kinds of things that are now, I didn't mention this, I guess, as I started, but the slides will be made available. We'll post them on the website, so you will have access to these. So, why are we applying systems biology methods um, in a variety of fields, including immunology? Because in, in reality, it's not necessarily a new approach in terms of some of the modeling that's going on, uh, but the way it was often applied was uh, when we use reductionist approaches, and I don't know if we still are, but we, in, in many cases, trying to move beyond that. Uh, but certainly when I was a graduate student, I was isolating an enzyme, in this case from cow liver, this was back before you could close gene jets, this was back uh, And so I studied that and, and made enough uh, discoveries that I was able to get my PhD on that. And that's basically what people were doing, the reductionist approach. But now we realize we need to try to build things back up. But even then, and it was back in the 1960s, 70s, and so on, people were trying to develop mathematical models, in this case, typically, of biochemical metabolism. Now, that, in that case, they had limited resources in terms of data, and they certainly had limited resources in terms of computation. But that was really the beginning of much of this, where they were trying to integrate things a bit, but they were somewhat limited just to the, the data and analysis. Uh, and so what we're trying to do now is take all the data we can collect through these high throughput methods uh, and build models to help us understand the systems in more depth. And so I like this slide that came out a number of years ago, old school versus new school, and so this would be me sitting there in my department of biochemistry, even have a hat thing like that one. Uh, and so we're fishing out a protein and studying it, trying to understand more about its structure and function. And now we cast a wider net uh, in a department of genomics, proteomics, for example, uh, studying more of the proteins or more genes or whatever it is uh, that you're particularly interested in. So it really is this, this transformation of life science disciplines by some of the computational mathematical methods uh, that's really driving much of what we're trying to do now. So what do we mean by systems biology? Well, we want to understand the structure of the system. It might be a gene regulatory network. It might be a biochemical network. But it's more than just knowing the structure. We want to understand the dynamics of that. Um, and that ultimately then can hopefully allow us to use it in a predictive way. We want to understand how it's controlled. And then also there's what we would say understanding the design methods. That is, uh, there are people for example, here at Virginia Tech and elsewhere, who are looking at the various kinds of components that could constitute different kinds of systems. Uh, John Tyson, for example, 
they're on some of the number of the students' committees, and they're studying bi-state stable switches and various kinds of, of switches like this and the various possible configurations to find out which ones are likely to be functionally relevant. Uh, and so it really is trying to understand at the very basic level why things work the way they do. Uh, so if we can understand it at that level, then we can begin to understand a bit more about the biology that's going on. So this is one view of systems biology and really sums up most of what I'm going to be talking about. You've got a lot of these connections, perhaps a, a cellular signaling pathway or something like that, a lot of these connections. And for the, for the immunologists, certainly you've seen these as you've either learned it, studied it, and other search. Uh, so the, the summary here is that that's why we need a computer, because they really are very complex. Uh, so hopefully during the week, you'll learn more about how we can develop mathematical descriptions of these and actually solve them on a computer. So as we talk about essential features of a system, uh, and again, I think I've made the point, but I want to really emphasize it. It's not just the assembly. What we need to do is certainly draw the diagram, but that's really analogous to having a static roadmap. We know where the pieces are. We think we know how they're connected. But what we really want to know are the traffic patterns, if we want to use that particular analogy, and how we control those. We need to know those dynamic interactions uh, and how they're involved in driving that whole process. So, as we talk about some of this and we talk about developing models, I want to take a step back and talk about what we really mean here, uh, especially in the context of this particular course. Uh, so really, in this context, we're talking about an abstract representation uh, of a real system, but we're doing it in mathematical terms. Uh, and things you'll learn if you haven't done modeling, you'll learn, you can't really include all the details. You might say, okay, here's my, my network, I know I've got 100 components, and this is how I think they all fit together. Well, that's probably not gonna be a good place to start. You need to start with something that uh, may have just the essential details. And in fact, you're hoping that you can figure out, out of all of this that seems to be working together, what are those essential components? And that's one of the things you potentially can learn. Now, in terms of the realism of this, it also, I mean, when I say abstract, it could get relatively abstract and you would lose some of that realism. But you can capture the realism where the entities in your model correspond to your real components that you're measuring experimentally and that the rules that govern how things are interacting and so on actually correspond to real laws. Uh, rather than something that's more abstract. So again, that's something that you'll learn and you'll see uh, through examples and through some of the hands-on sessions. Um, and ultimately, what you hope to get then is an integrated description of various components and also at various scales. And we'll talk a little bit about multi-scale modeling today, but then in much more depth later in the week. So why do we do this? Well, we want to represent what we know about an existing path. If you've started to work with these complex pathways and they sit down and start to write it out on a piece of paper or on a computer or whatever, then you can see you've got a lot of different components, but what you really need to do is try to figure out how does it fit together. And you also are probably asking the question, am I missing anything? And sometimes in generating a model and seeing how well your model agrees with your data, you might say, well, I think I'm missing something because this really isn't a good uh, you can also determine the most critical components. You can work with your model, put things in, leave things out. What things are really the most important in that model? What really seems to drive it? Um, and you'll learn some of the tools within Composite, uh, for example, to help you learn a bit about some of those kinds of things. Um, you want to be able to test, refine hypotheses. And really, I think, as experimental uh, immunologists, that's one of the the strengths of some of this is you want to have the best hypotheses possible, right? You want to learn the most in the experiments uh, that you do. In fact, uh, there was a definition of a bad experiment. It was from a book that, well, hopefully you've heard this, but this goes back to my era, Set in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. <laughs> Stefan, at least remembers. But in any case, the quote was, the only bad experiment is the one where everything goes exactly as you expected and you still didn't learn it. And so that's why you want to have good hypotheses to develop the development of this And then I've got in bold and in blue a couple of terms here. You'll see a lot if you begin to read this literature. You want your models to be able to predict something 
uh, and basically what you'll have is a model, and then just in the model you can perturb the conditions and see what happens. And that's the advantage, see, without having to do the experiment. And that may then lead to the hypothesis uh, that you could test. Or in the redesigning the, the network as you've got it set up, or maybe perturbing it in some way, you can begin to observe the emergence of new properties. And you see that term a lot as you read this literature, the emergence of new properties. So maybe there's something that you didn't even think about, that you're going to learn by having generated that model. So this is a graphic that shows types of models, and again, uh, thinking about things in a qualitative sense or quantitative. And really, where we want to be thinking about this week are these quantitative models over here. Uh, so over here, with the qualitative, we're basically talking about topological descriptions. <coughs> and you've probably seen some of these kinds of diagrams where, yeah, we know sort of how things are connected. This reminds me of what we see, for example, as you're looking at protein-protein interaction networks. And and so on, where it seems like a lot of things are connected, yet we don't really know why that's functioning for you. But then over here, we're beginning to what we might call the kinetic models, the dynamic description. We have kinetic parameters. We're using differential equations, at least in some of these cases, to generate a model where we can actually run this model. We can simulate the system and hopefully learn something from that. So that's really we're focusing uh, on some of these quantitative computational models. It's not that it's not important to use these sometimes, qualitative ones, that can be your starting point. But ultimately, you can think about how to get over here. So as we look at dynamic models in biology in kind of a general way, so we've got dynamic systems. And so as we talk about dynamics, it really can be in a number of different levels. Uh, so here we've got, over here would be molecular dynamics, looking at dynamics of proteins, for example. Uh, and then biochemical networks, and we'll look at some of these a bit more. And then population dynamics. Modeling of population dynamics has been around for a long time. And if you begin to study some of these things, you'll find some of the, the literature that goes on related to predator-prey relationships and so on. So that was some of the early modeling. That really has been an example that's often used as one's learning some of these things. But here, and also with metabolic networks, that was where some early work was done. And I'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, just to put things in perspective. Uh, signaling networks, various kinds of those. And then we've got an immune system on here uh, as one example of the Wilson cellular signal. So you can see that it applies. There are a lot of different types of dynamic models. The focus here is computational immunology. And you can see that it can be applied in a number of different ways. So and I mentioned the biochemical metabolism just to bring out how this was applied early on. So what I'm calling the heyday of metabolism research. The 1920s to 1950s. People weren't doing quantitative modeling then. That came a bit later. But people like Hans Krebs got a Nobel Prize in 1953. And I suspect many of you have taken a biochemistry course at some point. So you learned the Krebs cycle, uh, for which he got a Nobel Prize. There were several other people over the, the course of those years. But the reason I showed this, you might say, well, that's, you know, that's old stuff. Well, I'm showing it mainly because this came out in 2010, a quote from Stephen McKnight. And it makes the point that even if you, well, one of the points is even if you think you learned metabolism and you took your biochemistry course, there's still a lot more to be learned. And what is still missing, and the point he makes, is the, sticks, the more sticky problems required attention to the dynamics of metabolism and that were pushed aside for decades are now known as interesting and important challenges. So at the biochemical level, this is important, and it's also important at, at other levels, and we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about multi-scale modeling over the course of the week. So in terms of modeling representations, and I'm using an example. I picked this one because it's, well, it's teaching the biochemistry. It's a slide that I have that you also made. I've covered it uh, in a biochemistry course. We look at different formalisms for doing quantitative analysis, for example, of enzyme kinetics, which is the McGill's Mint approximation. Uh, so if you study biochemistry, you saw things like the KM and Vmax and so on. And this can also be expressed as mass action kinetics, as it's illustrated here. And in fact, you may remember that from this, you can derive the McGill's Mint equation. But in any case, you've got this expression, uh, these differential equations in terms of rates of disappearance and appearance of various components that are part of the system. So, uh, and, and so those different kinds of notations are different 
But the point in all of this is this is going on as you're developing these ODE models, for example, in Composite. Uh, and if you wanted to see what those were, you could, though at the same time you could still generate the models and run them without getting uh, into those particular details. So, just a little bit about the pausing, and Stefan will tell you a lot more about it this afternoon, and you'll actually be having some hands-on experience, and hopefully you've got it, all got it installed on your computers uh, at this point, but if not, we're hoping you'll get that done prior to the start of the afternoon session, but if not, we can help you with that during the afternoon session. Complex Pathway Simulator, uh, it's a standalone program, it's got graphical and command line versions, and a variety of functions associated with it, and you'll learn, as I say, you'll learn more about that this afternoon, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through details. Uh, this are, are some of the features, some of the standard methods that were included, uh, and you have opportunities to learn more about some of these. Depending on your particular interest, you'll learn more or less perhaps about some of them. But one of the points I wanted to make, and one of the reasons for including all of this, is that Proposi supports use by non-experts. That is, we need non-expert modelers. Uh, so really what you need to understand is the biology of your system, the immunology of your system, how things fit together. Uh, it does help. You're going to need to know a little bit about parameters in terms of how one thing transforms into another and so on, or the rate at which that happens. And that's one of the key things that uh, also has to be part of these models. And you'll learn a bit more about that, especially as you hear some of the examples uh, of the application uh, to experimental problems. People will talk a bit about how they parameterize the models. And I've got just a couple screenshots here uh, just to illustrate the kinds of things you can see within Kopasi, metabolites. And so basically, when you've got your model set up, you can look at it in different views. And one of the views is something like this. I realize you can't see all the steps. You'll be able to see this in your computer. In this case, it's a biochemical pathway. And so these are the various components of that particular pathway. You can also look at it from the reactions view and see how that's set up in the reactions. You also can use it as a test. If you think you've set up things correctly, and then go and look at this and say, wow, that didn't actually do what I thought. Then you look and you can find out perhaps you didn't enter things correctly. So, Copasi is one of a number of different programs. Uh, there are a number of modeling tools. If you go to sbml.org, the Systems Biology Markup Language, SBML. Uh, as of the uh, June 4th, when I checked the other day, there were 262 packages that are available at sbml.org. And again, I realize the text is small here from this screenshot, but I chose this particular shot because it's got Proposi uh, on it. It's all listed alphabetically. It's cell design, but it's also on here as well. Uh, so in any case, for all of these, you've got the program, and then it tells you a little bit about um, the capabilities of the program, uh, tells you a little bit about the availability, tells you if it supports SBML, the Systems Biology Markup Language, input, output, that kind of thing. So the question always is, well, 262, how do I pick one? Well, Kopasi is one you could pick, and, and the way you pick these kinds of things is, well, you can come to summer schools like this, learn a bit more about it, and find out if it has the capabilities. But you're also then going to be meeting people who are using it, uh, it is being developed here at Virginia Tech. Uh, at least one of the developers is here with Stefan. So, you know, it's always good to know these guys if you're trying to, to learn to use one of these programs because they're the experts in making them really make it happen. And you'll be talking to other people during the hands-on sessions or with some of the students who have used it extensively. So you'll really be able to get help and find out more about it if the is the right one for you. Now, as you're building the model, there are various ways. Certainly you have something that you're interested in and you want to think about building the model. But what you also might want to check is there's a BioModels database, the URL of which is given here. Uh, and basically what it is, is a repository of these peer-reviewed, published, computational models. At this point, there are 530 curated, 655 non-curated models within that database. Now, it's one of those things where if you were to go and search, let's say you type in like call us, you're probably going to get a lot. It's kind of like going to the protein data bank and typing in lysozyme. You get hundreds of things. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of others that are going to be more specialized. And certainly models that are developed here are deposited in 
in uh, biomodels database that other people have access to. So if there's something you're interested in, go and look. See if somebody's already developed something like it or maybe a piece of it. You can learn from that in some cases as the basis for what you want to do. Or you might find that nobody's done it, which can be good news, especially if you're thinking about how unique your contribution is going to be uh, to the whole field. So just be aware that there are resources out there like that. Uh, this gives a pie chart that shows the different kinds of models. A lot of it, this big piece of the pie, are cellular metabolic processes. But again, that's because a lot of that was coming early on where uh, people were studying various metabolic pathways and being able to generate models from that. Uh, signal transduction, however, is another big chunk of the pie, very important to so many processes. Uh, and so people have intense interest in that. A number of them related to cell cycle and so on. So you really have a number to choose from as you begin to think about uh, generating your own models. Now, if you talk about formalisms for model, basically you need a way to represent your model. You've got your picture. Uh, and so as part of a hands-on session, we're really going to be learning how to formalize that in a way that it can be simulated. So when we're talking about modeling and simulation, at least in my mind, the modeling is you know, putting that model together the simulation is actually running the model to see what happens. We operate a model under configuration to observe what the behavior is. Um, there are various considerations as you select a formalism. Uh, for example, what is the objective of your study? It's, it's something you should ask yourself before you build any model, really, is what you want to learn from. I mean, that's certainly the kind of work I do where we're trying to predict structures of proteins, for example. And we can generate what we call homology models of protein structures. Uh, which is a relatively easy thing to do. But when I'm on a student's committee and they say, well, I'm going to generate this model, my first question is, well, what are you going to do with it? Having that isn't useful unless you really get thought about how it can help you. Uh, the scale of the model, the size of the model, how many components and so on. Nature of the data, what data do you have? And that's something you'll also be learning about this week. With all the data you are collecting, how can that be analyzed and used in a way to help you generate and of course, the availability of software tools to let you do what you want to do. But that's another of the things that we'll be learning more about. Now, this is one of those cases where there's uh, a number of terms that are used. And so I've got them up here. You'll hear things related to sites. And these are kind of one or the other, in a sense. Static versus dynamic models. Continuous versus discrete. Deterministic versus stochastic an equation-based versus agent-based. Now, for a given model, it's likely going to fall in one or the other of these. But for example, some of these biochemical network models that are going to be out there are going to be dynamic models, continuous systems, deterministic, and equation-based. Okay? And that's really the case where you have all the kinetic parameters, a lot of them, put some of these things together. But what I've got here is a little bit then of ways to think about these to distinguish one from the other. What kind of model is this? So if it's static, you've got the connections, but you don't really represent time in anything. So the dynamic, as it does a name, you can just incorporate time. Deterministic versus stochastic. And, and Joseph mentioned some of this as well as he talked about uh, being able to even make hybrid methods, because in some cases you can. So with deterministic, you don't have any probabilistic components as part of your system. Uh, there, you have a uniform biochemical environment. Output is determined by the parameter values, initial conditions. Basically, if you run the model the same way every time, you're going to get the same output. Okay? And these are sometimes a good place to start because they're simpler and faster to compute, but depending on your system, they may not be the best choice. With stochastic, there's an element of randomness as part of this. Uh, often we have fewer models that are available to participate, but these, in these particular cases, because of this randomness, your output is not going to be the same every time what you get with what we would call an ensemble output. They're slightly different because of that randomness. Okay? But some types of modeling, that's basically what you get. But that can be a good thing uh, as you think about certain systems. It may not be good to treat certain things as kind of an average which is what happens when you've got a lot of molecules um, kind of looking at the average output of these deterministic systems. Uh, continuous versus discrete. Here I'm using a couple of examples. 
variables change continuously, like say the age of an individual, and then if variables have a discrete value, if you're looking at numbers of immune cells, it's not changing necessarily in a continuous way. You have a discrete number that's changing in some, in some way. Equation versus agent-based. Equation-based is well, mostly what we've talked about so far this morning, uh, where you've got a model that's developed in a set of equations. With agent-based, you have a set of agents that encapsulate behavior of the individuals. And so we'll talk briefly about that, and then you'll be hearing more about that during the week. Uh, there are different scales for these formalisms uh, in terms of, uh, here we've got deterministic differential equations, so passive differential equations, agent-based, and then over here, molecule up through organism. And mostly what these arrows are depicting is how these have been applied. It's not saying it potentially couldn't be applied at some of the other scales, oftentimes to convenience or availability of certain tools and so on. But uh, in any case, that's kind of a general guide. So with agent-based modeling, you have agents, a discrete entity. Right? It's got its own goals and behaviors, and those can change. Um, it's really autonomous, um, and so it can adapt, modify its behaviors based on things that are happening uh, in its environment. There's certain assumptions you make as part of this uh, in terms of being able to describe some of these behaviors and so on, uh, but that's really the rules that you're applying in these models. And in this case, the systems can be built from what we say the bottom up. You can think about all the components that are part of this and develop rules. And this has really applied a lot. If you were to just search for agent-based modeling on Google, for example, some of the initial examples you're going to see are going to apply to social sciences in many ways. And so in terms of modeling people, groups, organizations, this is often applicable. So if you think about people randomly, certainly you have to be taken into account. Uh, and then also social insect swarms, but then also heterogeneous cellular systems. And it's often uh, a good way, if that's the kind of system you're dealing with, to think about agent-based models. And so when might you use them? Uh, well, there may be cases, and that heterogeneous cellular system might be a good example, where there's a natural representation of, uh, as agents, uh, and then they have to have decisions, behaviors assigned to those, and it has to be handled discreetly uh, in the sense that each one can be somewhat different, depending on what's happening. Um, and then they have to adapt and change their behavior. Uh, they need to have dynamic relationships with other agents that are part of the system. Those, agents, those relationships can change. Um, and then often you'll have a spatial component uh, that's part of that. And that basically, if you're thinking, let's just think of an example of a heterogeneous cellular system in some of the different places within whatever uh, physiological system you're studying, that also can have an effect on their behavior. Uh, so these can be relatively intuitive. If you think about your system, you use the cells that are part of it, for example. Uh, think of those as agents that can work well in three dimensions. Uh, you can reproduce relatively complex behavior with a few rules. And uh, you can get, and this again is this emergence, these interactions. You can learn from this to make the emergence and structure and function. And as mentioned, you can hybridize these in some cases. The e methods and you'll learn, you'll see some examples of that uh, over the course of the week. Uh, so an example uh, is NISI, uh, an agent-based modeling program, the Enteric Community Simulator. Uh, and so you'll actually get an introduction to this tomorrow in the hands-on session, as well as having some lectures related to it. Uh, and it's specifically designed for studying gut immunopathologies, um, and hopefully it can be used for identifying treatment strategies, for example. Um, there's a decent visual a component of it, which is, I think, the one you'll be seeing uh, for control of visualization and so on. And this is taken in from one of their papers. Uh, you may see this one again, that's a different one of their papers. But in terms of different states, the different kinds of cells can adopt. And so this thing will actually change. The color of the cell can change depending on what state it's in. So that can actually help you follow what's going on in the model. So, as we think now about what we might call multidimensional biology and multi-scale, so oftentimes you might be thinking of a biochemical network, a cellular network, and you'll see models develop in each of these, but as we begin to think about multi-scale modeling, we're really thinking about well, how can I develop a model that actually incorporates more than one scale in my model. And so some of that will be uh, at least discussed during the week, 
Uh, but these are a couple graphics that deal with that when you think about everything from the gene up to assemblies of cells. Uh, would be a good example of a, a complex system uh, or here a simpler diagram and again going from a small system, small part of the system up to the organism level. Now I realize you can't see all of these components, but one of the reasons that are in this slide, one of the reasons I, I chose it, this is from one of Martin Meyer Schellerstein's paper I mentioned told you later in the week. Uh, so you may have a chance to meet with him, talk a bit more about uh, multi-scale modeling and some of the work that he is doing. But what we have here is in terms of modeling approaches, it's some of the things we've talked about. We've got ODE methods, we've got agent-based methods. Uh, they've got a scale here, everything from single molecules shown here uh, all the way up to the organismal level. So again, we're thinking about all of it. And then over here, and one of the reasons I like this, is it also incorporated experimental approaches. Everything from structural electrobiology and some of the methods we use in protein biochemistry uh, in, up to various kinds of uh, cytometry and so on, and various kinds of work microscopy that can be applied in looking at things at a bigger and bigger scale. And then this last slide, and you might look at that and say, okay, that really, how does that relate to everything? Well, it's still multi-scale. Uh, but the other reason I chose this one is that one of the authors on this particular paper, it's a recent review from uh, annual reviews of biomedical engineering, uh, is that Shane Pierce is one of the authors. She's at the University of Virginia. She's going to be one of the presenters at the symposium on Friday. So again, somebody else you might be able to meet. Uh, while you're here and learn more about how they're applying um, multi-scale modeling. Uh, in this case, they're doing some interesting things that have to do with pathophysiology. I'm not sure uh, exactly what you're going to talk about on Friday, but it's, it's perhaps one aspect of it. And I think that's the last of mine. And I, yeah, I guess I have a couple minutes for questions. How do you overcome bias? What's the starting point? Is how do we define the charges of genes and then use the model based on that? Or even have anything that hybridizes on the chip? So you're thinking about micro rate kinds of data? Yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah, micro rate, there are all kinds of issues. I'm sure, sure you're aware since you're asking me about that in terms of the quality of the data and so on. But are you thinking of that trying to generate a gene regulatory network from that? Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the challenges you're going to have, but it, it certainly can be applied, and that's I think where modeling can help, is that you can actually, have, as, as you generate a model, when you're going to have certain biases that you're going to be aware of, that you're putting things in, and certain assumptions that you're making, and that's one of the key things with anything, whether it's experimental work, computation, or to try to define what your assumptions are. And if then you know those clearly, then you can build your model and then run it, simulate it, see how well it agrees with the data you have, and see if there are places where it just doesn't fit the way you thought it might. And then the advantage of the model then is you can very easily, without collecting more data, go ahead and change them uh, and see if it changes the behavior of the model. Um, and that may help you understand a little bit more about you know, things in the model that may not be uh, as represented as, as correctly as you hope for. Sure. Actually, you're saying that the modeling will help you eliminate the bias. Because you put the bias in the model. The model makes predictions that contradict your experiments. So you have had bias in your assumption. You start correctly. So the model is not an end result, it's a tool in the understanding process. So having a model with bias is net. Is, is there a rule of thumb for in terms of the size of the data sets? When you're talking now about validating models, mm -hmm. running it, running and examining it, it's new data. Does it have to be the same scope as the model is based on? The, the, what are the considerations? Yeah, I'll, I'll provide it from my perspective and then others may want to chime in too when they generate some of these kinds of You might say, well, you can't have too much data, but at the same time, uh, as you think about things, there may be so much that it becomes overwhelming and you can't think about how, what kind of model to develop because you have so much. 
Uh, but I think you know, having, having a reliable set of data to cover most of the components that are part of your system is what's going to be key. But there are ways that of doing analysis um, of various aspects of the model in terms of sensitivity. Looks like Abby wants to comment? Yeah, I want to comment on that. So you're raising a really good point here, which is how big my network is going to be versus you know how much experimental data I have or how much experimental data I need to generate to validate this model. One of the things that we'll be teaching you here in the summer school is different strategies that you can follow to gather this data, either through sequencing and using IPA, either through mass cytometry using cytokine. And then um, you can have a huge network, we're talking about maybe 200 nodes in here, but your prediction may be related to just a subset of three or four nodes. Therefore, your validation experiments that you need to run with your in vitro animal studies will be just focused on these two or three nodes. And I'll give you an example this morning about one node in a bigger network. Yes? may want to add to that as well. So the question basically is, as you collect data and you're looking at things from a multi-scale perspective, various kinds of data, do you have to get things all at the same time point, or you know, might there be some other ways that one need to collect those data? Certainly the classic examples of that, uh, where the selection of time points can really uh, have a big effect on the outcome, has to do with comparing <coughs> gene expression data with protein expression data, where you know, because of you know, lifetimes of all the various components and lag phases and so on, is that you may say, okay, at this point there, I'm you know, getting a lot of this gene being expressed, and you don't see the protein because of the lag. And, and so, I mean, there's no really clear answer in terms of what's going to be the best way because of all of that. And, and the biggest, you know, perhaps the biggest problem then is just the expense in various ways, time and money, in terms of collecting all of that. So I don't know that there's any clear cut answer for that because there could, could be cases where collecting at different times might make sense, but at the same time one always has to then defend when you've written something up, well why did you collect this 15 minutes later than that? Uh, so I think one really just has to make judgments based on what you know about the system of making those decisions. Does anybody want to chime in with David how that content? You actually think that's the crucial point. We need to defend the same. And Dave I actually, when I go, I'm more on the side. If I go to the experimentalist and say, okay, make this area experimentalist, you have said, 100 mice, kill one in the So I said, I cannot do that because nobody will publish that data set because I need to have repeats. For me, as a model, the repeats are worse. I get more information if I have to kill every day. The, the variance goes out then. So I actually get more information. Often, now, because of this restriction, we need to make, we cannot publish the data if we don't do it. So what we need to do is, we need to pick time points. How often do we say afterwards, man, we got small time points? So it is, different time points is actually not the, it's the problem. The thing is, can you defend your, uh, your data set that you create? And does your message, which you use for analysis, allow you to have some of the messages we're going to talk about belong to a different time. And that's it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. So, yeah, yeah. A quick question, perhaps, because we're going to move on. You would think that uh, you both mentioned and experiments. Yeah. How do you deal with uh, when part of your data, maybe pictures of the data, in the human uh, trials, where you have a great variability and you control all the Parameters, so you have different populations, time points that are restricted, versus some data that might have in animals, and the data from animals might come from mice, monkeys, and maybe even other species put together in one model. Yeah, that's so. I want, could we defer that to the discussion yeah. perhaps? Because that's, yeah, that, that's, 
Uh, it's actually something that's probably going to come up later. I, I mean, situation. We, we have situations like that where we have animal, animal studies in vitro, in vivo, and uh, then human studies. So we're still talking about the same kind of model, but we need to address, address for different kinds of language. We're not 100% overlapping. We're not necessarily 